Hey everyone, it's Bob Crossan. I'm the editorial director for the Endeavor Business Media Water Group, as well as the editor-in-chief of Wastewater Digest. I'm joined today by Dee Kamada. She is director of offer management for cybersecurity solutions and services at Schneider Electric, and we're going to be talking about cybersecurity. Dee, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, well, one of the things that we wanted to talk with you about, I, I mean, Cybersecurity is becoming a bigger thing that people are talking about in the water and wastewater industry. It's obviously been a bigger issue with some other utilities over the years, but why are we seeing this, this trend toward this being an important point of contention? And what do we kind of know about the current occurrences of cyber attacks in the U.S. on these systems? Yeah, I think that the attention for cybersecurity and the water wastewater segment really came to light in February of 2021 when there was a attack on the water treatment plant in a small town in Florida. And the way that that attack happened was they remote connected into the facility and attempted to change the chemical thresholds in the water. Mm -hmm. And had that attack been successful, that water could have had dangerous levels of this chemical and ultimately be poisonous to the community. And the thing that was interesting about that was the intent. So it was a small town in Florida um, and mainly focused on distributing to, to people within the community. And a lot of the times when we talk about critical infrastructure and cybersecurity risk, we're focusing on or highlighting things like the power grid, but really the emphasis now is on the impact on the water wastewater segments. It could have really harmful impact. And so that's where the attention around it came to be. And I would say like any other critical infrastructure, uh, the systems uh, that support this segment are really intended to last for a long time. Mm -hmm. So these challenges are not unique. So systems that are 10, 20, 30 years old, not designed with security in mind, are critical in the sense that if operations are impacted, the uh, population that it impacts um, is a vast audience. So I would say that, you know, the challenges are not unique, I, but I think the number of attempts has become more frequent and also more public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I feel like I'm hearing more about them now. I, I know AWWA, American Water Works Association, as well as Water Env Environment Federation are both putting a really big emphasis on talking about this with their most recent trade shows and events and stuff like that. So it's obviously becoming a bigger concern for the, the larger industry uh, associations in the industry as well. Um, but one of the things I think that was really driving that ha happened last year with the U.S. presidential administration, putting such an emphasis on cybersecurity, having that 100-day cybersecurity sprint. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what came out of that? Like, how did that inform the way that we look at cybersecurity in the water wastewater sector? So I think the U.S. cybersecurity directive, what that did was put a lot of awareness as to what needs to be done when it when it comes to cybersecurity, and it focused on critical infrastructure. So within that framework, water, wastewater, oil and gas, chemicals, buildings, all of those fell into that group. And I think historically, you've maybe heard this a lot, the OT segments or industrial segments, utilities, were pretty slow to move on cybersecurity. So when you think about it, um, you know, we would say roughly 10, 20 years behind IT. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges was the uh, dedicated budgets to cybersecurity. So with this emphasis, there's a drive really to actually implement cybersecurity and a need to do it in a timely fashion. And so I think the budgeting and the finances behind it have aligned. But one thing that I want to point out is that while this has driven a lot of awareness, which is really great, a lot of the principles are really consistent with the standards that are out there. And so the beautiful thing about standards in this directive is it provides a framework and a way to think about cybersecurity in a structured manner. So a lot of the concepts are really aligned with those standards. So when you think about what's within that directive, it starts with a risk assessment and really mm -hmm. understanding where your starting point is, what your assets are, et cetera. And from there, it really focuses on some principles that you know align with the principles of zero trust. So access controls, network segmentation, all of the patch management, et cetera. 
And then lastly, and I think most critical that's coming to light is around instant response. So really figuring out how do you contain an incident quickly and how do you recover from that incident? And so I, I love that they had a directive that drove action quickly, um, but I also want to just confirm that it's aligned to what cyber security professionals have been saying for a long time, but it really, now there is a, a um, urgency, I would say, mm -hmm. to drive to actually meet these requirements. So you mentioned urgency there, and uh, I mentioned that the associations are putting a lot of more effort behind this. Uh, what are some of the other trends that you're seeing? I know there's barriers. You talked about f uh, financing and the money behind it as well. So what are some of the trends and barriers that you're recognizing in the water and wastewater market when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah, the first trend that I've noticed is a huge uptake in the requests for assessments. And I think that that's a great starting point. And the assessments range from anything from a gap assessment up through some very detailed assessments to focus in on areas of high risk. And then secondly, it's, an, it's a known challenge that talent, um, OT cybersecurity talent, um, is limited, costly, and hard to retain. And so the demand for managed services is definitely risen as well. Um, and that creates a relationship between the uh, water wastewater plants and then also vendors and uh, solution providers. And I think that community of um, professionals working together actually helps strengthen the security posture and alleviate some of the uh, concerns or stressors around costs um, and around just knowing what to do, where to start and having you know, IT teams and OT teams work together. And then the last thing that has been popular for a couple of years, but still I think is gaining traction is OT detection tools. So really having a monitoring system in place to give you real time information around the assets in your environment and uh, threats that may pop up and being able to quickly uh, triage your environment to understand mm -hmm. the impact because one known thing is that the threats are really continuous and some of the threats or vulnerabilities may or may not impact your specific um, environment. And so I think that monitoring component of it has also been a big trend. And then one last thing is, I think that there's better understanding from executive management due to things like the US directive. Um, and so the challenges around getting funding or proving the ROI um, they still exist, but I think that there's more willingness and an openness to hear why uh, cybersecurity controls need to be implemented. Yeah. Well, this is all fantastic information. I appreciate you spending so much time with us. Is, is, where's a good place that people can learn a little bit more on this subject and get a better understanding of what they maybe should be doing to begin their path if they haven't already? Yeah, so the first place and uh, that I'd like to plug is Schneider Electric has um, multiple cybersecurity teams that focus specifically on, on this. So we have some blogs that focus on the water wastewater segment and also a webinar that you can look at. Um, secondly, I also am a big fan of the information on the CISA.org or sorry, mm. CISA.gov site. I think people go there to really understand maybe risks that exist or directives, but a little known fact is there's also training on the site that mm. much of it is free. Um, they have some really in-depth information. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot of OT cybersecurity kind of forums and communities on LinkedIn. So I definitely recommend getting plugged in to get information almost in real time as um, events occur. Yeah. And you can network with your peers. So if you have a problem, you can ask one of your peers about that exact problem they may have already solved. So Exactly. And, and that's one great thing about this community. It's, it's relatively small, I would say. Um, and we talk about the challenges in information uh, sharing, but there are a lot of communities where we want to just share information. So there's mm -hmm. InfoGuard um, and there's other, you know, organizations such as such as that that the sole purpose is to share information to create a more secure uh, world i would say mm -hmm. awesome well thanks so much d i really appreciate you taking the time to talk chat with us today thank you for having me
Yeah, and for everyone who's watching, check out the video description below. We'll have some of the links that Dee had mentioned down there so you can check those out. We also have some other resources on our website that you can see as well. And once more to Dee, thanks again.